Hello and welcome to Conversations, Up Close and Personal Dialogues about Leadership. I am Mahesh Das, Chair and ACSA Distinguished Professor of Architecture at uh, Ball State University. Today's show is the fourth in the series of dialogues with transformational leaders from the profession. I am delighted that we are joined today by architect and my fellow ACSA Distinguished Professor, Juan Miro. He is the principal of uh, the award-winning firm Miro Rivera Architects in Austin, Texas. He is also a professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Miro has reached the pinnacles of excellence in the profession and in education. He has a great distinction of being elevated to the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects and the ACSA College of Distinguished Professors. His designs have won many national awards. So I'm very pleased to welcome him to Ball State University today. Juan, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Absolutely. And uh, your journey has been quite interesting and uh, quite different to where you are today. Uh, Absolutely. Could you perhaps talk a little bit about uh, you know, the overview, if you will, a 35,000 feet view of your life and career. Well, I, I, I have been asked that question very often because when people tell me, are you from Spain? How come you're in Austin? You know, <laughs> what brought you here? And sometimes I say, well, how long do you have? <laughs> you know, because it's a, it's a long journey, but it is incredible how life takes you to different places and you know, you just uh, need to try to take advantage of, of those opportunities. I, in my case, the journey started in Barcelona. I was born in Barcelona, in Spain, and uh, we moved to uh, Madrid when I was very young. Uh, my father was an architect, and he started to have more and more work in Madrid, so moved the family. We're seven brothers and sisters. I'm the fourth one, the last one that was born in Barcelona, and then we moved mm -hmm. to Madrid. And uh, that's where I grew up. I studied architecture in Madrid. And uh, I finished very young. I was uh, a year ahead in school, and uh, I finished, uh, a, you know, very quickly a career. I, the studies of architecture in Madrid are very demanding, and it takes a long time. And uh, I knew very clearly since my probably second, third year at school that I wanted to go abroad after finishing. And in Spain, we had to do the military service there, so I finished the military service, and, and, mm. and, and, and I applied for a Fulbright. And uh, uh, I got the Fulbright uh, to do a post-professional master's at Yale University. And uh, that was an interesting change because I had never been to the U.S. when I landed at, at, at Yale. Everybody was asking me there, like, What's, what, are, what other schools did you visit when you were selecting the school to go to? I said, I just got here. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't visit any school. I came straight. And so Yale was a, an incredible uh, experience. Uh, and the Fulbright was an incredible experience of all the people that I met from around the world. And uh, uh, I knew at the time that, in a way, going to another place opens the possibilities that you don't go back to where you come from. So, but I never really thought about it that way. I always thought that I was going to go back to Spain. When I finished at Yale, it was the big recession of the early 90s. It was 91. There was basically not much work in New York, but I, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll go, I'll go back to Spain. But I met Charles Watme in my last semester at Yale, and Charles Watme asked me if I wanted to go to New York to work with him. So I didn't have to look for work, which is, was good, because at the time there was virtually no work in, in New York. And so I said, yes, absolutely. So I went to New York thinking that I was going to be there a year and a half, because that's the maximum that I was allowed to with the Fulbright. Uh, but uh, eventually I asked for a an ex basically a change in my visa status to stay longer and they, they gave it to me and I was able to, to continue working there with uh, Charles Guathme in, in New York. I, sp I ended up spending six years in New York and then a project brought me to Austin and then uh, my wife and I just got married at that time, fell in love with Austin, started a practice there, started teaching there and we are now in a way, we don't feel like we are in one place only because we go to New York regularly, we go to Spain, we have a place in Spain. So 
this this idea that the world is getting smaller is is true in a way. But uh, that's that's what brought you know that's that's a very quick kind of arc of the trajectory of the journey of my life getting to Austin. I understand that uh, architecture runs in your family as well. Your father was an architect mm -hmm. in Spain. Yes. Right. Uh, do you think that uh, that has had an impact on your life and career? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no uh, way around it. I mean, I, I, I was uh, my father was a very good architect. No, no. I mean, he was an architect, but he had uh, he was one of the you know well-known architects of the, especially in the 1960s, Spain had a great uh, architectural uh, um, transformation and the work that was produced there was uh, fantastic and my father was one of the, were the, the protagonists of that period and so growing up in a way, uh, you know, you, you don't know very well, you know, what, what it means but you, you start to get some hints of what it, what it is like to be an architect in the sense that I early on realized that architecture probably compared with other jobs was more of a life type of job that doesn't really end when you finish the, when you when you leave the, the the office of the studio and uh, I could see it because my father kept sketching in any single piece of paper that he found at home uh, you know during the weekends was going to see job sites and, and it was a very good way I do the same thing with my kids you know take them to job sites on the weekends in a way feeling like you're spending time with the family, but at the same time, you're, you're getting some work done by visiting job sites. So I was going through that growing up, and it was, uh, in a way, putting an interest in, in, in that way of life. And uh, uh, my father was uh, uh, interested because when I told him that I wanted to study architecture, his reaction was, are you really sure? You know, it was, <laughs> are you really sure that you want to get into this? So he, yeah. was, he was kind of trying to be realistic about the fact that it was it's a demanding career and you, mm -hmm. need, you need to be very certain that that's what you want to do but uh, I knew that he was happy about it and uh, I'm the only one of seven siblings that became an architect so uh, I think he was good at chasing away all the rest. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> I, had to carry the torch as yeah, well. So I, I, I was the stubborn one and you know how it is in school when you're very good at math and at drawing everybody says uh, you, you have the ability to handle Mm -hmm. The two things that everybody says architects need to be able to do, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of ex artistic expression and the mm -hmm. more uh, technical. And so it, was, it felt very natural for me to go into architecture. It was something that I, yeah. I didn't think too much about. What kind of choices did your siblings make? Well, it, it ranged, uh, but uh, my older sister went to fine arts as an artist. Uh, uh, the other ones have studied from sociology to uh, English uh, to um, uh, what is uh, what you call uh, agrarian engineering. You mm -hmm. know, so there's there's a big range. My actually my youngest brother is the one closest to architecture because he he's a project manager. He's he, stu he studied architectural engineering. That is, uh, there's not like an exact equivalent to what aparejador is in Spain, but. Uh, is uh, very much in, in, in the architectural world because, but he's more on the construction side of, mm -hmm. of, of the business and mm -hmm. he has a great uh, sensibility as well. Mm -hmm. So he, he always uh, tells me of all the problems about the projects that he's working on because he looks at the project with better sensibility many times than the architects that are designing the projects that he's building. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, I think uh, when you make a career choice and you reached a point of excellence and uh, recognition in your career that, uh, uh, you know, when you look back and say what were some significant influences on your, uh, you know, career and your, your life, you know, who are the mentors, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, I, I think uh, we realize that uh, mentors are absolutely essential uh, in our ability to grow and our ability to develop in life and career, uh, and and you'd mentioned, you know, there have been some significant influences and people who have guided you. Who would be some of those? And well, obviously, my my father is the first one from, in a way, putting me in this uh, career path. But uh, yeah. I think that since early uh, um, in my career, I felt like I I had to complement some of the things that I was. Uh, already exposed to with other things. So for example, when I was in architecture school, 
I on purpose uh, selected a professor that was very influential, that he was uh, very different than my father. So in a way I saw that it was probably a good thing to expose myself to different ways of seeing architecture. My father belonged more to the, you know, old school type of practitioner that he was with his pencil producing on his drafting table. That was what made him the happiest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and, and I took a professor there at, uh, in Madrid called Juan Daniel Fuyahondo that was very different way to see architecture. He was more of an intellectual in a true sense of the world, in, you know, a good writer, very interested in many disciplines, uh, editor of a very influential magazines from the 60s. And, and he was a very interesting uh, aspect of architecture that I became exposed to at that time. And he, he, he was the one that made architecture feel like very connected to other disciplines, mm -hmm. other lines of thought, being uh, philosophy, uh, uh, literature, and it was, it was very, very important at that time to kind of broad, broaden the, 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 the type of ways that you can think about architecture. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, uh, uh, Charles Wandy played a pretty important role. I met him at Yale. I went to work with him, and to me, he represented this uh, very focused and professional way of running a, a, a very, very successful office in New York City, a very competitive environment. And it was fascinating to see his drive, his discipline, his focus. And, and once again, it was, it was very different from the type of architecture he produced than what my father uh, had done or was doing, in the sense that he belonged more to the more Le Corbusier, way of looking at modern architecture. It was an interesting uh, parallel in a way. He was the American looking at European uh, models and my father was more interested in Frank Lloyd Wright and that more organic mm. way of understanding modern architecture. So I, I, I enjoyed that sense of being exposed to a different way of doing things and then started to find that there were more commonalities that may be evident. But I would think that those are you know, the main uh, influences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you came to Yale and you had some very interesting experience at Yale mm -hmm. uh, because it was a post-professional degree and mm -hmm. uh, you had a choice to really explore your different interests, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I understand they continue to be your interests and continue to inform your work and your life. Yeah, very, very much so. I mean, here, here, you have to imagine, like, the School of Architecture in Madrid is super uh, professional oriented. So yeah. we had, at the time that I, was, I studied, it was six and a half years minimum to, to get your degree. Very demanding, not a single elective in the whole process. Interesting. <laughs> you, know, you can imagine. It was all a lot of structures, a lot of construction, a lot of... Uh, 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 of the technical uh, aspects of, of the profession. Mm -hmm. we, w the School of Architecture is in the Polytechnic University, so it really comes more from that side rather than the fine arts. Mm -hmm. So the, the architects in Spain have a very good technical training. And so when I, when I landed at Yale, it was fantastic because it was, being a pros as you said, being a post-professional uh, degree, I was not required to really take anything in particular. It was studio and then I had a, I, I remember the, the, the blue book that Yale puts out every semester with all the classes that are offered. It was just the, the most stimulating thing you can imagine, like going through the book. It's like wanted, a kid in the candy store. Yeah, exactly. You wanted to take all the classes. So I, and, and I started to take there while I was at Yale uh, a lot of classes on pre-Columbian studies. And, and it was something that I, I have always been interested in history since I was uh, young. So uh, it was, uh, Yale was a, a good opportunity to explore some of these uh, um, new worlds in, in a way. And literally, in this case, was the, the, the architecture of uh, pre-Columbian times. And some of the best scholars in the field are at Yale, from the Inca to the Mesoamerican uh, uh, civilization. So mm -hmm. I, I took a lot of classes with uh, uh, those professors with, uh, from Berger, that was one of the leaders in, in, in Andean archaeology, to Michael Cohen, Mesoamerica, Mary Miller, our art historian, and George Kubler was still there, but he was retired. And so it was, it was a great way to widen the, the, the range once more. And in this case, it was more looking at things from the past and seeing how people, why, in my case, I like to look at history with the eyes of a designer, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that these professors were fascinated with the, the, the discussions that they had with, with yeah. me and with eventually other colleagues came to take those classes as well. 
and it was uh, interesting to see how they reacted to the, the, the comments that we would make about the sites that they had been studying, mm -hmm. but they were coming from different angles, anthropology, archaeology, art history. Coming with the eye of a designer, we were looking at things from the past with uh, new insight, and this is something that is still fascinates me. So when I still teach Mexican in, in the school, I teach Mexican architecture, and, and that's one of the, the things that I think the seed was planted at Yale in terms of how, why people do what they do, why do they build what they build, and trying to understand the reasons behind that, and the common threads. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the things that tie uh, places and you know, different times in history together in terms of the, the common motivations and the drive behind mm -hmm. what they do. And I'm mm -hmm. still very much fascinated by that. Would you say that you, I mean, I'm, the way I'm seeing it is you probably discovered yourself uh, while you were at Yale and you were exploring a variety of interests that are broader than just a narrow uh, slice of technical aspects of you know one particular discipline and a profession. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the experience that you have had there? Uh, absolutely. I mean in a way it was not only the, the things that I was studying uh, yeah. there but it's also the people you meet and when you come. Spain uh, it has changed now because there are more people now that, that immigrated to Spain. But Spain was a very homogeneous society to, to some degree with uh, a very fascinating history. But uh, coming to the U.S. was, uh, you know, widening the, the type of cultures and people that you, you could meet just in, mm -hmm. your, in your studio, you know, yeah. people coming from different parts of the world. So that's one of the things that I knew I wanted to be exposed to, to just kind of, deal and, and, and mm -hmm. learn from other ways of doing things and studying and, and yeah. sharing ideas and, and that was definitely one of the things that attracted me to the to United States. I mean here is extremely welcoming the society in terms of mm -hmm. the essence of the United States is people coming from different parts of the world and making this country what it is. So I I I'm, I found that very much, you know, I, I, I sense it that that's one of the things that I, mm -hmm. I why I wanted to come and it, it was Definitely yeah. confirmed when I came. Yeah, and uh, you know, taking this to a level of you started your practice in Austin, and uh, it was Michael Dell's house that you were doing, and uh, one thing led to the other, as they would say. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you discover that you wanted to teach, and how did you get started with that? Yeah, that's career? interesting. That, that's interesting. You're right. You know, with uh, uh, Charles Guatme, you know, when when he was hired to do Michael Dell's house, and I was the project architect for that project, I started to go to U to Austin. That's the reason I went to Austin. And so, um, at some point, it was easier to stay in Austin and uh, uh, go back to New York occasionally because the job required a lot of uh, field presence. So, uh, when when the when the house was coming to an end, it felt like it was the right time to to that's when my wife and I really liked Austin. We had just bought an apartment in New York, so we were very excited about staying in New York. We were not looking for, you know, leaving New York. I always said that I, I wanted to go back to Spain and I wanted to stay in New York, but I ended up uh, in Austin. So it's not because I was not intending to go back, but in case of Austin, I think it was when that project was finished and, and, and we thought about staying, uh, Actually, Charles Watney said, you should, you should go teach uh, at UT. I had taught there. He, he told me, I had taught there before, and it's a great school. He had taught there in the early 70s or something, and he really liked it. Uh, in fact, he remembered always the Longhorn T-shirts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went with him to buy another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he, he's the one who suggested that. I said, oh, well, that's a good idea. And so I went there to teach one semester in uh, a graduate studio, as, uh, what they call vertical studio for graduate students and, and I had never taught. Even during my years at Yale, I had never thought about doing TA, you know, I was so focused. I had so clear that I wanted to be a professional architect that I, and I was working in New York and I was enjoying that and, but I knew that there was something there about this, especially this, uh, all these studies that I had done at Yale. I had been working with a, with a classmate on an exhibition that we did at Yale during the time that I was working in New York. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were working on a book project. It was very hard to do anything while you were working so intensively in the professional world. So getting to Austin and teaching uh, felt like all of a sudden a way to incorporate that into my life again. 
the, the notion of keeping this more uh, intellectually uh, stimulating uh, um, world going in parallel to mm -hmm. the practice. So I taught that semester. It went very well. I, I, I was so naive about it, and, and, and I, I always think when I look back that the <laughs> first project that I gave when I came there was a, a sports arena, 20,000 uh, sports arena, 20,000 people sports arena, and it was fantastic. This, some of these students had never really done anything even close, and the work was very, very, very good. It came very natural to me how to do it and how mm -hmm. to teach it. The students mm -hmm. really liked it. They, they basically uh, told the leadership in the school about it, and, and there was a position open at the school, and uh, I applied, and I, and I got it. But I did not know very well what tenure was or anything. <laughs> when I tell this to people, they don't believe me, but I say, look, I, the, the system in Spain is very different. I hadn't I really didn't know very well what tenure was until I, I, I got a tenure track position. Right. And that's when, when basically I said, yes, this is something that I want to do. So I, I, kept, I kept both worlds running in parallel. It was, it's a very demanding thing, but I, I, I definitely didn't want to stop practicing and the office was growing, but I, I wanted to keep uh, uh, teaching. Sometimes people t tell me, why, why do you still teach? I mean, it looks like you have so much going on with your practice. Right. And it's, I want to keep both. I like it. And, you know, on that note uh, of teaching, what motivates you in teaching and what do you enjoy about it? And, and how do you continue to balance uh, or synergize, for that matter? Uh, we, we assume they have to be in competition, but not necessarily so, right? So how do you maintain these relationships between, uh, you know, practice? Obviously, you, your office has been doing quite a few projects of significance, and then you've got full-time teaching and... Mm -hmm. and uh, the other parts of the academic life. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring them together? It's, 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 well, in the kind of big picture, I, I like the, 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 the fact that both of them benefit from mm -hmm. having the other uh, right. going on at the same time. So when, when you're in the academic world, being in practice makes you, your teaching very, very, very well connected to the issues that you face every day. So in a way, when I talk to students, there's a sense that I... I have a very good uh, sense of the pulse of being in practice, so it is it is a very uh, it's, it's a good way for them to get a sense of what it almost when they talk, I talk to them they, they know that they're talking to someone that is in practice every day I mean, right. and it shows uh, but at the same time it's, it's a very good um, it's, 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 it's all the one of the things that uh, uh, teaching forces you to do is to articulate your ideas. You need to express mm -hmm. what you're doing and how, how those, those things that maybe when you're only in practice, you don't need to explain to anybody. You need, yeah. to, you need to, in a way, you for, it forces you to, to look back, to understand your process, to understand uh, uh, issues in a more uh, uh, deliberate way. So it's, it's, very, it's very interesting how that can start having an impact in the way you, you think about your practice. You know? So yeah. it, it really works both ways. But the question about how I do it, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot do these things by yourself. So, That's right. you know, in my case, I, I have, I'm incredibly lucky in the sense mm -hmm. that I have uh, a fantastic uh, support around me. I mean, my wife, Rosa, is uh, critical in, 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 in basically um, coming along with the journey, in, in the journey with me in terms of the, she, she runs the office from the, she's not an architect, but she runs the, uh, uh, all other aspects of the office and uh, of my life as well, <laughs> and uh, she she's very important in making it easier for me to think about doing both. And the other one is obviously uh, my partner Miguel Miguel Rivera, who is my brother-in-law. He's yeah. the one who introduced me to my wife. So we really have a very strong family uh, nucleus, and yeah. and uh, he's 100% uh, on practice. So in a way, is 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 the only way that we could have grown the way we have grown in terms of the practice and the, mm -hmm. the type of projects. But the, the critical things to be able to switch back and forth, I mean, that's not necessarily something that is easy, but uh, I have learned how to, how to do it, to be four hours with students and be very focused and very, very yeah. connected to what they're trying to do and then finish that and then go to a meeting with a client and producing something for a deadline the day after. Sometimes you have to work late at night. 
I tell that to my students all the time, say, you, you have a deadline, I had a deadline too. <laughs> you work until 3 o'clock in the morning, I worked until 3 o'clock in the morning too. Yeah. So it is, it is it's still a little bit like being in a stu studio environment with deadlines and with the kind of intensity. So I, mm -hmm. But I like it. I like to work under pressure. You know, I mean, you talk about partners and so many of architectural practices are driven by partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you talked about you know, what you learned from your father and uh, the way his practice operated and how that has informed your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any parallels or are there any differences that uh, you, you refer back to and say, you know, in many ways these partnerships are different or similar or that you've learned lessons? What can we learn from that? Well, that's uh, it's, such a, it's, it's such a hard thing to, to find. To, I mean, it's a little like finding a partner for life in terms yeah. of, you know, your, your, your wife or it is, it is not easy to find partnerships for mm -hmm. professional uh, endeavors. I mean, it is, and, and I, you know, when it works, it works and it's fantastic. But what I know is that, for example, I, I, I grew up exposed to two very different partnerships. The one my father had with, he had a partner and Charles Guafney. And ours is n nothing like any of those two, which is interesting. My father and his partner had nothing to do in terms of personalities, in the mm -hmm. sense that my father was a family man. Um, his partner, Fernando Guerras, was a brilliant architect, flamboyant personality, very entertaining, very politically incorrect, got in trouble because he <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, basically he, he's the person that I know that would say whatever he thinks without really any kind of regard, <laughs> you yeah. know, get, got, got him in a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. To the point that I, I, I think is, they, my father died two years ago and uh, his partner died shortly before. Uh, none of the children of, of his partner went to his, his burial, which is, which is to me it was shocking when I heard that because, you know, I remember when my father died, the, the whole family was there and it was so close and so I knew very clearly that I, I don't want to be, uh, if, if it means uh, sacrificing a, a family, I, I don't, I don't want to get into that kind of uh, theory that, you know, when, mm -hmm. you're, when you're a genius, you have to, you know, have to do those things. I mean, I say mm -hmm. I don't believe it, you know, in the, in the sense that Fernando Guedes was a genius, but yeah. it's too much of a price to sacrifice your family for that. And so the, the partnership that Guadme had with Siegel, with Bob Siegel, it was also very different. They never did anything together, you know. Mm. They, they, they were, you know, Bob Siegel would say very proudly, yep. it's like, we haven't had dinner together in 30 years or something, wow. you know, something that it was very clearly not parallel lives outside the profession. With my, my partner, Miguel, we really have a very different type of partnership. We can mm -hmm. work all week long, and then on Friday night, we go to have dinner together, the whole family, and then on Saturday, we go for a day trip together, you know, so mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time together and it's a true partnership beyond the, the professional and, mm -hmm. and, and our lives are you know all combined because you know he's the best friend of my wife my wife and you know they're the, the closest siblings that I've ever met in terms yeah. of that they really need each other so and it's a, it's in, a lot of people say how can you be together so often you know every day you know, <laughs> I say you know, we get along well you know why not you know it's fantastic so we really, we really uh, have a level of trust that is uh, basic, you know, very, very, very important to, to get good partnerships. And in this case, mm -hmm. it's 100% there. So I feel very privileged to have that type so of partnership. I'm, so what I'm hearing is that uh, in a partnership, you've, uh, you look for something to complement you, who is not exactly the same as you, but quite different, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, is complementing mm -hmm. your work skill set. and. Mm -hmm your attitudes and, and your strengths mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what you're talking about with your father's partnerships mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously they had a long-standing partnership mm -hmm. despite the difficult personality of uh, the partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you are also saying that um, there is a myth probably in architecture mm -hmm. that you have to be a difficult person mm -hmm. in order to be successful mm -hmm. uh, and if you become a celebrity then you have to be difficult, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, but then uh, there are so many examples mm -hmm. of uh, right from starting with Lucan or even mm -hmm. before or after, uh, where uh, being a good human being, mm -hmm. uh, being a good citizen, mm -hmm. being generous, mm -hmm. being kind and giving, mm -hmm. thinking positively, mm 
mm -hmm. and uh, uh, being open. Mm -hmm. And all of these are the qualities and characteristics mm -hmm. uh, that would strengthen the relationship and gender trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, in that sense, what I hear you saying is that uh, you've evolved a, mm -hmm. a set of partnerships, mm -hmm. a set of relationships mm -hmm. that are serving you mm -hmm. in both practice and in teaching. Mm -hmm. If I understand it right, uh, your partner Miguel Rivera, uh, he doesn't teach no. full time, right? No, no, he doesn't teach at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and it's true. I mean, there's always some uh, complementing that you know and help. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're a team, right? You're working as a team, and there are certain things that one is better than the other at doing, and you know you you rely on. But it's important not to take things for granted, and you know, and and keep mm -hmm. keep always evolving that relationship. But it is. It is definitely true that I, I, I believe that you don't, you, know, you don't have to be a difficult person to, 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 to do well what you do. To do well. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's just something. My, my father was more of a pessimist, and he always, you know, complained about all the manipulation behind. I mean, he was not necessarily the best person about promoting himself or getting the job, or he was more like focused on doing what he liked to do. And, and, mm -hmm. and in a way, he saw always that the... the, the you know, he focused more on the negative sides of, of that sense that th those that are, you know, really uh, stabbing pe people behind the back are the ones that are going to get ahead. And, and my, my approach for, to life has been basically saying, no, I don't believe that. I'm going to, in, in a way, probably my mom <laughs> has more of that positive side. It's, it's always interesting when, when my mom always said that when the phone rang at midnight, at home, I, my, my father would always think it's like some, something Crisis. bad mm -hmm. bad news. And my mother would say, oh, someone is calling for some good news. <laughs> or some, something good must have happened. Someone is calling. And yes. it is true. I mean, I, I, I try to be more of an optimist in the sense that, yeah, you know, people, people, there are people around, you know, you that are not necessarily there with the good intentions. But, you know, my theory is that you can, you can overcome all that just by focusing on getting what you do well and, 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 and let things kind of fall in place in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of uh, the uh, challenges you've faced in growing your practice in particular, uh, what were some things that uh, you would say uh, are significant in terms of uh, not necessarily negatively affecting but challenging mm -hmm. you as an individual but also uh, you know, as a practice, the firm? Mm -hmm. uh, what are some moments? Well, the, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that, f uh, and this is again probably consciously or unconsciously following some of the mentors mm -hmm. or, or, or models uh, yeah. uh, from, from the past. And one of the things that is interesting is that, for example, in Spain, architects are not as specialized as they mm -hmm. are in the, in the U.S. And one of the things that I always att uh, was attracted to uh, of, of Charles Watham is his ability to work in a range of projects. Mm -hmm. He was doing still residential work with, you know, great dedication and, and care, and he was working on skyscrapers, museums, libraries, uh, all kinds of uh, commercial buildings. So it is, uh, to me, something that I was always very interested. Uh, you know, a little bit like Fran Wright, that in a way he, he, he didn't see any difference between designing a chair or designing an entire city, right? Mm -hmm. And, and my father in Spain was a little bit the same way in the sense that he, he was working on a range of projects in a very natural way. So when, when we started the practice in Austin, because I went there for a residential project and the first commissions were residential, you get into this perception, people think that that's what you do, mm -hmm. you know, that that's what you do. You do residential work because that's what they've seen that you have done. And, yeah. and so breaking from that pattern is always a challenge because you want to do school work and then the way the system works is like how many schools have you done or oh, you haven't done schools before you know we're not gonna you know it doesn't work like in Spain that there are competitions mm -hmm. and you can enter into new ways of uh, new, new type of uh, uh, type of projects mm -hmm. so getting to break that that um, perception is always a very challenging thing and mm -hmm. and in a way that's what we have been focusing on and the work mm -hmm. that we do now it really it really um, has opened the range of types of projects, and that's exactly what I what I like the the, yeah. the, the range of, of work that both Guatemi and, and and my father were doing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so in terms of growing your practice, now your firm has done a wide range of projects, mm -hmm. right? Not just residential, but commercial and mm -hmm. some institutional and so on and so forth. Uh, and so you have a great team mm -hmm. that you've been working with uh, and Absolutely. a great talent pool mm -hmm. in Austin or elsewhere that you yeah. draw from. Uh, and so what are some emerging directions that you see for your practice that are in line with, you know, what you enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. And uh, where do you see that heading? Well, in a way, I think that getting to continue to work on this uh, variety of uh, scales is very yeah. important to us. So, mm -hmm. for, you know, that's the first thing that we're, we're, we're you know, focusing on in terms of even culturally uh, different from the fact that some some of our clients can be from uh, the Indian community. We're doing a project for the Indian community in, in, in Austin. It's fantastic. It's a school and a temple and you know we mm. love those type of challenges of getting mm. yourself into another type of uh, cultural setting and and working at the scale of a uh, highway. We're working on a, on a highway project. We're designing mm -hmm. some high, high, um, highway bridges and you know the whole context uh, of the of the of the highway a school uh, master plan for a school so that that to us is a, is a is an important aspect of of the the challenge ahead the mm -hmm. the thing that we we feel like are in a way connecting what we do with things that you feel like are becoming more relevant uh, now uh, you know really around the globe is is we are very interested in the relationship of what we do with the nature, you know, and this is a good understanding of the American city as a city that is uh, low density that allows mm -hmm. us to really interact with the natural systems in ways that is very, very different than in Europe. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work that we have done really starts relating, you know, creating relationships with the context in, in, in meaningful ways, in, in a little bit in the tradition of what you know, Frank Wright was talking about when in America you have, you know, the land, the, the, the nature inspiring what, what you do. So we, we think that there's a, an important way to connect with sustainability issues that is related to that way of understanding that unique relationship with nature that is the essence of, mm -hmm. you know, really American cities where, where nature and city have been more connected than in the yeah. European tradition. That was more like a compact city and the nature was outside the walls you know? mm -hmm. and so that's very important for us the other the other thing that is still very relevant in our work is the interest in in the structures in in how things are put together and this is uh, going again going back to that education i think that united states probably the the, the architectural training could emphasize a little more that uh, understanding of the structures as as, mm -hmm. as, a, as an integral part of the architectural project sometimes here it's perceived to be the engineer's problem and I think that we lose a lot of a lot of the essence of a project if you let the engineer be running a parallel process rather than integrating with mm -hmm. your design. So, a lot of our projects have a very clear expression of the structural system, and that's that's something that I think makes the projects uh, uh, better from the point of view of how they work. But it gives the architect more sense of understanding and controlling of the process in terms yeah. of value engineering that people will. Will, will you have more ways to to protect the design in a way when you understand how it's built and how it's conceived and how it's fabricated mm -hmm. so in this formula one project it was very critical to to be able to prove we can build this under this price range because we can do it this way and you know you know from the steel fabricator what you can do so the contractor has no way to to in a way argue in any other direction because it is it is very clear that you know what you're talking about mm -hmm. it's very interesting that uh, there are interesting relationships between how your journey has taken place so far uh, there's a it's interesting that I there is a notion of serendipity mm -hmm. right uh, things appear to happen and uh, and connect in mysterious ways yeah. that seem to open the doors and that seemed to be the case in terms of your education, mm -hmm. uh, your practice, mm -hmm. your teaching, and, uh, and the kinds of projects you have done. And, and it's also fascinating that you mentioned the bridges mm -hmm. and that the notion of bridge and bridging, connecting, uh, seems to have played a big role. Because when we think about architecture and what architects do, uh, there is often perhaps uh, 
there is a notion of privileging of certain size. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't do projects of this size, then you're not doing architecture mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. But v in your work, uh, what I find fascinating is uh, you have done the smallest things to very large scale things and very large size things, mm -hmm. not just scale but size as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Um, could you talk a little bit about what are your views mm -hmm. about, you know, when particularly uh, our students get out there in the profession, uh, there, is, there is an unsaid assumption that seems to play, saying if you're not working on a project of this size, mm -hmm. you know, it's not significant. Yeah, no, I, I definitely don't believe that. I think that at the end of the day, uh, and this happens to us many times when clients come, it's like, oh, this is a small project, I'm sure that you're not interested. We say, look, scale has nothing to do. We're <laughs> not, we can be interested in any project, no matter the scale, if the right circumstances are. I mean, when people are looking for good design, it's just the most important aspect of why mm -hmm. we're interested. We reject a lot of projects when we feel like there's no uh, real desire to, to do anything you know well done I mean so you're know. saying that you you're guided by values and principles mm -hmm. of what aligns with your interests what uh, motivates you and inspires you rather than the size of the project oh yeah sure. absolutely I mean right. I think I think that is is very important as also for students I think for students is, is particularly important to 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 not have that pressure to feel like you need to be doing this or that I mean I think architects probably in architecture school we put too much pressure on you know, you are supposed to be designing, you know, and in charge of these projects. And we, at the end of the day, architecture can be many things, and you can be working in, 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 in very critical design decisions in other settings, you know, mm -hmm. because the, a lot of the decisions about design happen outside architectural offices. Right. And, and that's very, very critical that we instill that in our students, that there are other ways that you can promote good design and good cities and good urban design that is not necessarily based on the heroic image of the architect as the uh, genius designer so from for our point of view from our point of view in, in the in the office the the scale and this is i know that it's not an easy thing to translate but mm -hmm. because there are some architects that can do better the transition from a small to bigger scale mm -hmm. uh in in our case i think this and you know being very good at understanding the goals and the essence of the problem because this is something that we forget sometimes but architects every time we have a project is because someone has a problem someone mm -hmm. has something that needs to get done so mm -hmm. that's the beginning of the essence understanding that and understanding that very well is more important than the scale because mm -hmm. the the tools that we have to design are very easily uh, translatable from small to big scale, but you need to be able to understand this, the problem, no matter how what the scale of the of the project is. What's the smallest project uh, in terms of the size that you have done, and what is the largest project? Well, the the the, the smallest project probably is this uh, restroom that we did. That is what uh, is uh, the minimum that you need to to have the wheelchair turn around inside the you know and it's it's not even air conditioned so it's like 10 square feet or that is a know. powerful project yeah and, it, and, and court and steel yeah the court and steel and it's is but you can see an example there of and we did that pro bono i mean they came to us uh, we need to do a new restroom and 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 it's that's distilling something to the bare minimum saying one yeah. single material no mechanical systems natural ventilation no artificial light so that's very small but for example, the, the essence of the solution thinking, the, the, the problem solving thinking that goes beyond that, behind that project mm -hmm. is very similar to the large scale project in the, in the, in the uh, circuit of the Americas, the Formula One track. It was so many different things coming together in terms of pressure for time, for money. The site was very large. The understanding what was the essence of what the client needed was yeah. what made us the, the the, the ones, the, the two goal guys, in a way, they were looking for more answers from us because they were, they were getting responses to the things that they were facing, and, and that was a site that was huge. It was six, you know, yeah. six hundred acres, you yeah. know, the whole site. But it's interesting that uh, the, you know, the notion of relationships. You, know, mm -hmm. you talked about the relationships uh, in terms of your father's practice and father's time, and uh, and how you begin to uh, see them differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I understand that you know in each of your projects, 
you have had a special relationship with a client mm -hmm. uh, where things evolve mm -hmm. and uh, and they have to line up with your set of values mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and w w could you talk a little more about the notion of the interpersonal relationships uh, and their importance uh, in your practice mm -hmm. and what you know in particular uh, our colleagues and students could mm -hmm. you know understand mm -hmm. from that notion that it is not necessarily about the building mm -hmm. but it is about the relationship very, very you know it's a very very interesting uh, aspect of you know and this how uh, you know in a way relates to some of the reasons why I'm interested in history and looking at things from the past because I'm very interested in that that moment where someone decides I need to build something yeah. and we come to the table to mm -hmm. try to understand what is that desire, what mm -hmm. is behind that desire. And it's very, very critical to understand and have that relationship with the, with the client because at the end of the day, we are not operating like artists that we can go mm -hmm. into a studio and produce a, a wonderful uh, painting, a wonderful design for no particular client. We yeah. operate, and I like that about architects. Yeah. We, we are a service profession. We are, we are providing a service. So someone has the need to build something. If you don't have an ability to connect with that source of that desire, it could be a person, it could be an institution, it could be a committee, but you need to have a very good connection. And right. the, the only projects that in our case we have had bad experiences working with clients is when they're intermediaries and you have no access to the, to the decision makers. Yeah. If you don't have access to the decision makers, it's not a very, I mean, now we have come to the point that we don't want to work in any project. When you have like that situation, we say, well, I'm the one that, you know, you tell me what you think you're going to do, and I'm going to explain it to the client. Say, <laughs> that, that, that's a war. We need to be there to explain mm -hmm. that. To, to, because that inter, inter in, in yeah. the relationship that is personal in the yeah. sense that is very important. You know, for example, their projects, this Formula One project could not have been done if the access to the client was not immediate and at any time because there was so much pressure to build it very quickly we could not wait for committees or you know it had to be a very and you, you create a bond that it works both ways mm -hmm. they they are getting a sense that they're being understood and they're getting you know and they all of a sudden they understood understand what you're trying to do so you, you need to understand what they're trying to do but then when you start producing you start generating you know a trust mm -hmm. you know and then they they defend what you're trying to do at some point yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, the Johnson Wax building that Frank Lorite, that he, Mr. Johnson always said that at the beginning of the project, he always liked to say that he had the most important architect in the world working for him. He said that halfway through the project, he felt like, I'm working side by side with the most architect, important architect in the world. He said by the end of the project, he said, I felt like I was working for the most important <laughs> architect in the world, <laughs> which, is, which is an interesting is, way where, yeah. like, at some point, Frank Lorite was able to, yeah. kind of establish that sense of this is what we're doing, this is why it's important that yeah. the client is the first one defending it. But you need to, you need to, you need to show that you are doing something mm -hmm. as a reaction to what they needed, yeah. and that you're taking care of their needs. Right. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the you know, question about what, how do you see your uh, practice? And, uh, and I'm talking about in the larger arena Mm -hmm. of not necessarily just, uh, you know, doing some work for somebody, mm -hmm. but uh, what are the principles and qualities that you aspire to mm -hmm. uh, in your design work, mm -hmm. in your relationships, mm -hmm. uh, in how you see your practice playing a role, uh, particularly in the kind of a liberal democracy, mm -hmm. you know, the society that we live in, mm -hmm. uh, which connects us with uh, the notion of education, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you are involved in each of these mm -hmm. areas mm -hmm. and you have the ability to bring them together. Mm -hmm. So what are those qualities, principles, and values that guide you and your work? Well, I, I always say that uh, as architects, and this I teach, I, I tell that to my students and I try to do in, in, our, in our practice, is that we have different areas of responsibility. We need mm -hmm. to wear different hats as architects. Yeah. and, and it's very important that we we show that we care. I mean, I always say that the the sense that you you are 
very professional. You're a service-oriented profession. You know, we need to make sure that we, mm -hmm. we, we don't forget that. So we, we take that very seriously. We, we're, we're not necessarily looking for fame or recognition for the sake of that because that's not necessarily what drives. I think in a way that should be a consequence of doing very well what you do rather than the opposite, which is yeah. many times people that are in a hurry, that's what they're looking for. And I think that the, in, in the, way, the way I see it is that you, you have those three, I say there are three major areas of responsibility as an architect. Mm -hmm. You need to understand why the project is there, how, how you really respond to those needs that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. You need to show that you are competent and professional about you know, how to do it. You need to understand all the you know, codes and ADA. And so there's a very demanding aspect to our profession that requires being very well prepared. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we do in schools. We, know we need to prepare people to understand the complexities of being an architect and, and yeah. practicing. And then we need to try to create something that is inspiring, that is uh, creative, that is artistic. I mean, at the same time, that's very hard because you have to do all those other things at the same time. So wearing these hats and trying to combine all this is very much at the essence of what we do. And I think that doing it well is, is when you are successful, when you, when you can really hit the, the, the overlap of those three areas and you are really responding to the needs, but you're doing something that is, you know, a famous thing, keeping the water out. You know, you need to keep the water out and you mm -hmm. need to at the same time make something that is inspiring. Yeah. We think that it's very hard to do that, but it's no different than what it was practicing architect 2,000 years ago. So <laughs> there are many things that have changed, technology, this, that, but at the end of the day, these three are the it's essence. interesting. The Vitruvians talk about it. Exactly, the mm -hmm. Vitruvian triad of mm -hmm. yeah, utilitas, exactly. fermitas, and exactly stars, what it is. And mm -hmm. You have to hit all the three, mm -hmm. not one more than the other. Exactly. But that it's a synergy between and uh, the connection between and addressing all three. And many times you have two of them. You, you're yeah. doing exactly what the client wanted, and yeah. you're doing very competently, but it's yeah. a terrible building. Yeah. That's, that happens, okay, you miss that one. Sometimes it's like a fantastic looking building, but it's not necessarily what the client wanted or it's not very well built. That's the problem. Now, on that note, uh, you have done very interesting and well-recognized works. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think distinguishes, uh, you know, sophisticated, great architecture from pedestrian uh, architecture? <laughs> yes, that's a difficult answer uh, because it's, 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 it's really one of the things that is also very hard to teach mm -hmm. when you, you know how it is, in that you have very, very... Uh, you know, but I mean, I mean let, maybe let me frame it in this way, that you, you are, you know, addressing utilitas where you are, you know, addressing function, program, yeah. and you are addressing formitas where the building is holding up, it's keeping the water yeah. out, sheltering people, uh, and so it does address those. Yeah. Uh, and so how, that, uh, how, how do you see that distinguished from, uh, you know, good or great architecture that has an impact, that inspires, and that uh, makes a difference? Well, I think that in a way, there's, first, there's, there's inherently a value in solving the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there's some beauty, some, some, some of the beginning of that great architecture comes with that sense of having addressed the problem at hand. Yeah. The other thing that I think is very important is there's a sense of connection with, with our time and where we are in terms of the evolution. You know, of, and that's one of the problems with kind of uh, trying to replicate things from the past that were successful mm -hmm. and not necessarily working anymore. There's a sense that you have to be very in tune with what the sensibility of the mm -hmm. times yeah. is. And then with the immediate context, what you're working on you're working in a particular place, for example, that bridge that uh, we designed, there's, there's an incredible sense of appeal for that bridge worldwide. And I think that is related to the fact that, I mean, it has been published all over the world. It has a lot of, I mean, we are the first ones that were very surprised as to how, what kind of impact it had. But I think right. at the end, when I look at it, I say, what is it that makes it so, um, in a way, universal? And I think yeah. that is, is, is it, it's clarity. There's a clarity of the idea. And there's a sense of connection to a particular place that makes it very universal. Because sometimes yeah. the, the problem of the regional uh, language is that sometimes it's forced to the point that it becomes very unattractive when it comes to, to you know, understanding that as, as a value, a cultural value. And, mm -hmm. and I think that it's like doing in Santa Fe, you know, 
uh, Adobe walls with two by four framing. <laughs> you know, at some point you start feeling a little, you uh, know, not authentic, no, not necessarily what, what, what the reason why they were doing Adobe to begin with. So connecting to an existing place, having a clarity of, of purpose, and, and connecting with the, the spirit of the times is, is at the end what makes some work stay above the rest of the work. Right. I, I, being deliberate about it is not necessarily an easy thing, but I think that you do it by being very connected. That's why I think it's important to connect with where you are, the place, being intellectually curious, being very, which is different than trying to replicate things from the most trendy magazine, but you need to kind of, in a way, be aware of what's happening, but not force yourself to, to try to replicate anything. So in other words, you're saying the, there, is in, there is some inherent value, obviously, in the education you received in Spain. Mm -hmm. It was technical, it was training, mm -hmm. uh, it would put you in a job and all of that. But what you <coughs> then, you know, bridged across to Yale and you learned mm -hmm. what you're talking about, right? You're talking about more ethereal, more sophisticated, more nuanced, mm -hmm. more uh, the deeper underlying cultural patterns and uh, understanding relationships, human relationships, mm -hmm. and and why cities grow, and what is the purpose of architecture. These are all the bigger questions, yeah. right? And this is what we call liberal education. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. The liberal education in the U.S. is a very strong. My wife always says that that's exactly what she wants for our kids because mm -hmm. it's a great way to, you know, confuse kids very, <laughs> very much, right, with all the range mm -hmm. of things that there are there. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a, I, I, would, I just want to go back for a second because I want to make sure that the education in Spain is very, is very professional, very technical, but it's also, it's, it's also very strong from the point of view of the quality of the, of the architecture that's produced. So yes. it's not necessarily like a trade school that you sometimes, I mean, I think, I, I still to this day believe from going back to that school mm. that it's probably one of the best schools in the world, in the mm. school in Madrid, mm. from the point of view of the, the because the, the architect as someone that has more control of the technical side mm -hmm. is not, should not be perceived as a kind of limiting negative aspect. I think it, in a way you, you, it's your friend. You know, that knowing that, is, is, I always tell my students, you know, the structures of a building are your friend. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to make sure that you know and control it. The, the architecture in Spain has a very um, good balance between having that creati creative mm -hmm. kind of vein and being very uh, open-minded in the sense that people are more open to new ideas so the testing that happens happens with a very good grounding mm -hmm. so that the, the education provo provides a very good, good grounding but there's also at the same time a very stimulating uh, environment from the client side to test ideas and this is one of the things that sometimes is more difficult here in the US right. because there's too some sometimes curiously enough you know and this is what drove crazy Frank Wright he was saying yeah. Why are they building every building in Washington imitating European buildings? Mm -hmm. He was going nuts. So here in the United States, we have sometimes that contradiction. There is a yeah. country that favors innovation and creativity, but when it comes to architecture, there's a sense of we need to go back and, and replicate things from other places. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that doesn't match the spirit of innovation that is basically promoted in almost yeah. everything else. In, 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 in well, would yeah. you say that is a borrowed authenticity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of original and innovative, something that belongs there, mm -hmm. that emerged and evolved from the place. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. And uh, you know, addressing now the issue of uh, education, uh, and if you were to <laughs> go back to school now, <laughs> what would you rather do? Ah. And I'm not saying going back as if you were an, a, a, the same younger person who went to no, school. No, now, you're going, going now. But if you're going now, mm -hmm. what would you like to learn, mm -hmm. and why is that important to you? Well, it's, it's very interesting because I remember that uh, when I finished at school at, in Spain, that is so long, and yeah. I was telling my friends, I'm going to Yale, I'm going to do two more years of, of this profession. And they were saying, you're crazy after all those years. You know, why would you go again? <laughs> it's like, right. and I feel like now I would, I would be very happy if all of a sudden I have the chance of getting back that blue book <laughs> at Yale and, mm -hmm. and going back to class. Mm -hmm. I feel like learning is such a lifelong uh, process that, you know, I, I, I see myself enjoying very much going to 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 school now mm -hmm. i don't i would not do it for any particular degree i would do it just from the for the sake of of learning so i i i can imagine that it would not be it probably would be a little all over the place in terms of 
what seems to be uh, attractive, mm -hmm. you know, in, of the cur uh, of the offerings. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it could be it could range from uh, continuing some of the interests that I have, for example, related to uh, ancient cultures. That is, is still something that really intrigues me and fascinates mm -hmm. me. But it could be more related to political, you know, I'm very inter interested in international politics and, you know, the issues that are, are hard behind the international conflicts, you mm -hmm. know. I relationships, again? Relationships, very mm -hmm. much so. And, and, and the funny thing is that I, I travel, I have traveled all over the world with my kids. I like yeah. to expose them to everything uh, in, you know, Japan, India, South, South America, you know, um, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, it's fascinating mm -hmm. to go to these places because at the end, more than the differences, what I'm fascinated is with the common commonalities. Mm -hmm. So when I study and, and, and I read and I look at even, even religions, you know, it's very interesting to see how much conflict come out, comes out of that when mm -hmm. at the end of the day there are many more things in common mm -hmm. than separating us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's probably what I will focus on. It's like, mm -hmm. Why do we have so many misunderstandings that are sources of conflict when at the end of the day we more or less are all after the same goals, you know, mm -hmm. and so the, the way we can do that and, and how we can learn from history in a way we always say that, you know, we can learn from history, but we don't seem to be very good at that because we kind of run into the same problems over and over. But yeah. that's probably one of the things that I would be interested in, in, in exploring if I were to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And that ties back to your uh, uh, interest in pre-Columbian mm -hmm. architecture and, uh, and what you teach in terms mm -hmm. of Mexican architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a very broad palette of uh, courses and ideas mm -hmm. that you've been dealing with. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, you were talking about history and the big ideas uh, that uh, have played a role. And uh, here you're talking about... Uh, a, a toilet in yeah. a, a trail restroom, in a, in which, by the way, is a fascinating building, little mm -hmm. building in Cortan. Uh, and so there is a range of things that you have been working with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also fascinated uh, about, you know, your notion that relationships mm -hmm. are what are absolutely important mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that's what you take forward and beyond. Uh, and that uh, that's actually what seems to be guiding your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one case, you talked about uh, how, in particular, the Formula One mm -hmm. racetrack in mm -hmm. Austin. By the way, congratulations on that mm -hmm. new project Thank you. Thank you. opening. And uh, uh, how do you see, uh, you know, I mean, that was a very serendipitous project where the client didn't quite know what, uh, you know, even to ask. Mm -hmm and uh, it evolved mm -hmm. uh, over time yeah. again uh, serendipitously and uh, and things like that uh, so hopefully we will get to see some of the work uh, later in the evening yeah, uh, Saturday. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the use of material and the poetics of mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. in your projects and uh, uh, and how you see those values translating into the rest of the life and uh, as well as the work of architecture, mm -hmm. those parallels are also quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly it is a great distinction that uh, you have been able to not only do well in practice as recognized by you know your elevation to the College of Fellows, but you have also done so extraordinarily well in education. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you've achieved the pinnacle in the ACSA College of Distinguished Professors, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there. So, what are as a as a kind of a concluding statement? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be your advice to somebody who's in school now, mm -hmm. or perhaps who is out in the profession and practice, but uh, would like to continue the notion of you know continued learning and education, lifelong education, mm -hmm. lifelong learning? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be some Concluding thoughts. I think that I, I think that the 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 notion of like being the world is such a fascinating place that yes. sometimes we close our doors to so many you know fantastic you know opportunities for learning for mm -hmm. uh, for letting things come to us and and I think that the, there's that the tends to be a uh, people tend to judge too quickly <laughs> you yeah. know and this applies to when I, take, I talk to students about I don't like the architect and therefore they 
close the door from learning about what that architect is trying to do and why, rather than s focusing on whether I like it or not, try to focus on why people do what they do. Yeah. And, and I think that in general, if you apply that to everything, you know, if you, if you're, it's almost like a combination of be very focused about doing well what you do. You know, mm -hmm. for example, when I'm, when I'm teaching, I'm teaching, I'm there. You know, this is, I always say that students have said in their surveys a lot of nice things about what, what I do in class. And, but the, the one thing that I like the most is that they have never said, oh, he seems to be more interested in his practice. He's not focused here. You know, when you are doing something, just focus. It's the same thing when you're with your kids. When you're, you know, try to stay very focused and, 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 and be clearly connect with the students, you know. So when you're connecting with your client, you know, in practice, it's the same thing. You need to show that you really care and you are listening, you know. Yeah. And then you learn a lot from that. And then be very open about, you know, the, 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 being open about the world, you know, makes you more tolerant, but at the same time reinforces what you believe in. And sometimes people feel like they, they threaten their, their belief system by opening themselves to other, other belief system. And I think that in, in essence, you know, if we were able to have that, that ability to be very comfortable with yourself, but at the same time very, very open-minded about learning from other places and other, other ways of thinking is, is, is going to be, it will be a much uh, richer exchange. And I think that applies to learning in the yeah. studio. Say, if you're looking at this architect, don't try to close the door, you know, so quickly. Yeah. Don't judge. Don't, don't, don't judge. You know, don't mm -hmm. jump to the conclusion before yeah. it's too early, before, before you really know. So yeah. give it a chance. So I would say that that's probably a very valuable uh, advice for, and I try to, to do it when listening to my clients and listening to their, I mean, what it appears a crazy idea that they're telling me yeah. about. I'm trying to <laughs> see how it can be interpreted in a yeah. way that it can make sense, you know. For, for the reality of whatever project we're working on. So it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to implement, but uh, I think right. it's, a good, it's a good thing to, to use for all aspects of life. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, on that wonderful note, I'd like to thank you for uh, visiting Ball State University and uh, sharing your thoughts about your life and work uh, and interacting with our students and, and our academic community as a whole. Uh, and uh, certainly want to thank you for your time. And, Absolutely, uh, thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much Appreciate for the invitation. It. I really enjoy it. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you.